Hi everyone, my name is Justin Comp. I have a PhD in exercise and health sciences with a focus on exercise promotion for health. I currently work as the fitness director for Sequence, which is a medical weight loss company that takes a holistic focus on weight loss with diet and exercise, along with prescription medication. My role there and also my career mission is to help people be more physically active. So in today's talk, we're going to cover the environment in which people exercise and specifically whether there are added benefits to working out outdoors. And joining me as always is going to be my assistant scout who will, thanks for looking, who will likely uh, sleep through this entire talk. So in Japan, there's an interesting tradition which is called forest bathing. Probably won't say this right, but it's pronounced Shinrin Yoku, so Shin, Shinrin in Japanese means forest and yoku means bath. So Shinrin Yoku means bathing in the forest atmosphere or taking in the forest through your senses. Now, forest bathing can be defined as making contact in the atmosphere of the forest. So anecdotally, I always feel good after I've had a chance to spend some time in nature. Uh, most weekends in the summer, we've been up in Vermont, which generally feels like a massive reset button from being in the city. We're in Boston. I, I can think of one year when it, we were in the city, I didn't have a car, so I wasn't able to really go anywhere. And I can say that not being able to spend more time in nature did feel like it had an impact on my overall mood. And what we'll find here is research does support that being in nature can have a positive effect on your affect, so your mood. So of course, the, that one year where I didn't have a car also happened to coincide with the fact that there was a pandemic and everything was shut down. So in this case, there's most certainly a con found there. But regardless, I think that most people can relate when I say that being in nature generally makes us feel good. So what I'll do is I'll cover some of the evidence for this. And we also know that exercise provides many health benefits. I've covered this, but essentially every health benefit that you can think of exercise provides. So I think that the, an interesting question is this, it's is exercising in nature additive? And we can think of this in another way. Is it healthier for me, for example, to take a walk in the woods than it would be for me to take a walk around the city? So why is nature good for us independent of exercise? So first, several mechanisms have been proposed to cause positive outcomes in response to exposure to nature. And this is specifically independently of increased physical activity. And this is because, you know, a lot of times if you're in nature, you're probably going for a walk, going for a hike, which is exercise. And these mechanisms include psychological stress reduction, attention restoration, exposure to cleaner air, secondary plant compounds. And I'll cover this later because I was quite unfamiliar with it. And I thought that this is quite an interesting thing on how plants can actually make you relax. And another thing is also improved social networks, assuming that you are, uh, you know, going for a walk in nature with other people. So let's start out with the 2020, 2010 study, which was published in the Environmental Health and Preventative Medicine. And this study showed that in a small sample, that forest environments did promote lower concentrations of cortisol, lower pulse rates, lower blood pressure, greater parasympathetic nerve activity, and lower sympathetic nerve activity than city environments do. And then 12 years later, in, in a 2020 systematic review, the authors concluded that forest bathing, so that, that Japanese term, can be effective in reducing mental health symptoms in the short term. And this was specifically true to anxiety. And one of the most established benefits of being in nature is also stress reduction, which is important because in 2017, an estimated 792 million people were affected by mental health issues worldwide. And I would tend to imagine that this number has increased since COVID. Why is this important? Well, the global economic burden of mental disorders is projected to be around $6 trillion in 2030. So that's some mental health benefits. So next, nature can also enhance human immune functioning. And this was something I found to be very interesting. I thought of it almost like the exact opposite effect of that movie in 2008 called The Happening, where plants were emitting particles that were killing people. Well, in reality, trees can actually enhance the human immune system by emitting what is called bioactive volatile organic compounds. And the main role of these compounds is to protect plants from herbivores and pathogenic microorganisms organisms by displaying direct toxicity, repelling herbivores or attracting herbivores enemies. And the majority of these bioactive volatile compounds emitted by plants are called terpenes and terpenoids. So in addition to its physical relaxation effects, 
terpenes and terpenoids improve various symptoms caused by inflammation by inhibiting various steps of the inflammatory process. And I'm not certainly not an expert on this, but I thought it was interesting. And that information was from a paper which was titled Therapeutic Potential of Volatile Terpenes and Terpenoids from Forest for Inflammatory Diseases. And this was published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. So we have cogn some cognitive aspects, stress reduction. We also have potentially some immune things that, that nature can improve upon. And being in nature also improves attention, restoration, and cognition. So two theories explain how natural environments can facilitate this, this type of uh, resilience, stress reduction theory, and attention restoration theory. The stress reduction theory was proposed by Dr. Roger Ulrich. It says that natural environments facilitate restoration and recovery from stress. Restoration outcomes of a nature experience include reduced physiological arousal, psychological stress, and negative affect, and also enhanced positive affect. Next to the attention restoration theory, which is by Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, who were at the University of Michigan, but I think that that was sometime in the 70s, hypothesized that natural environments contain stimuli that allow for the restoration of one's ability to direct or focus attention. Directed attention is an executive cognitive function responsible for inhibitory control and the ability to process information, plan, and solve problems. So the restoration of this ability to direct attention can occur through the use of a mode of attention that does not require any cognitive effort. And this is called involuntary attention. Now, nature, which has beautiful scenery, can attract involuntary attention, which can enable the restoration of directed attention. Now, in this theory, two stages of restoration experiences take place. The first stage is the attentional recovery stage, which involves clearing one's head of various thoughts and tasks and the recovery of directed attention. Then the second stage is reflection, which involves thinking about life matters and reflecting on one's life goals, priorities, and how to achieve them. It is through this second stage of reflection that this, this theory may explain how nature facilitates basically growth and also resilience. And this is also, this is an interesting idea as I've always really considered nature to be a great place to think, mull over, mull over ideas. Um, in the city, there are certainly quite a few distractions where your attention can be spread apart and you might not necessarily even um, realize it. So nature has a, a lot of health benefits. We covered some, some cognitive, uh, immune, and then also just mood in general. So just how it is troubling that not a lot of people get enough exercise because exercise has so many health benefits. Not a lot of people are being exposed to nature, um, particularly in America. Not a lot of people get outdoor time. I found a 2001 study, so I'm not sure how much this translates over to what the, it actually reflects today. I wouldn't actually be surprised if, if more people spent time outdoors after COVID since that's kind of, you know, what they were left to do. But this 2001 study by Neil Klaus reported that on average, we spent 85% of our time in enclosed buildings and about 6% of our time in enclosed vehicles. So that's, that's a lot of time spent inside. So what we have is we know that exercise is good and we know that nature is good, but is exercising in nature or being active in another context, like a suburb, like an urban context, just as good. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll explore that. So first in a 2020 study published in the Environment and Behavior University of Iceland, I was sorry, it was published in Environment and Behavior, and it was from the University of Iceland. It was titled Health Benefits of Nature of Walking in Nature, a Randomized Controlled Study Under Conditions of Real Life Stress. And the aim of this study was to compare the effects of nature exposure on mood and psychological stress responses and to disentangle the effects associated with recreational nature exposure from those linked with exercise, which in this case was walking, by comparing three conditions. So the three conditions were this. Participants did a nature walk. Participants watched a video of the same nature scenes. So it was the same scenes that somebody doing the nature walk would have done, but they're just sitting down and watching it on a television and then walking on a treadmill in a gym. So in this study, participants who were students attended a psychophysiological experiment twice. These conditions were under academic stress periods and also under a no stress period. So 
One took place when exams weren't coming up and one took place when exams were coming up. So when they were studying and presumably stress. Eligible participants were randomly added, allocated to one of these three. It was about 40 minute conditions. So again, it was that walking in nature, walking on a treadmill in a gym or watching nature experiences on a TV in just a laboratory setting. There were several things that, that happened in this study. So the first thing that happened was that participants had an ECG, which was recorded under resting conditions for 10 minutes. And then after that, saliva was sampled for cortisol. And then they were also assessed for their current levels of positive and negative affect. So basically, how did they feel? What was their mood right then and there? Participants then did their activities. So walking in nature, walking on a treadmill or watching that nature video. They then came back and did the same uh, assessment. So they had the ECG and then they assessed their mood. And then they did what was called the cold presser test. A cold presser test is, is quite awful. Um, I had to do it as a subject when I was working through my PhD. One of my fellow students was conducting an experiment and what he had me do was stick my hand in an ice cold bucket and then have me answer at least what I thought was complex math problems, but a lot of any kind of math problem when your hand is in freezing cold water is is not going to be fun to do. So anyways, the test essentially means they put their hand in really, really cold water. It stimulates extra stress. So after they did their ECG and then their and then also their assess their mood, they put their hand in the in the cold water. And then after that, they had cortisol assessed again. And then mood was once again assessed. So it went, it went our baseline assessments, the intervention retest. And then that that stressful test, the cold presser test where their hand is put in really cold water. And then those tests were run uh, again. So they were able to capture uh, cortisol and mood once again. So in this study, there were no significant differences in cortisol levels between the three groups during the no examination period. So when life wasn't so stressful. But during the examination period, participants in the nature group had significantly lower cortisol levels compared with the video group after the intervention. Also, after the intervention, participants from the nature group recorded significantly higher positive affect scores. And this was compared to both the gym group, the walking in the gym, and also the video group. So when the individuals or the students were under more stress, walking in nature resulted in the largest decrease in cortisol levels and passive viewing of nature scenes uh, resulted in the low at least uh, reduction in cortisol levels. But there was no statistically significant difference in average cortisol levels between participants walking in uh, nature or walking in the gym. But only the nature group reported significant increases in positive affect after the intervention during both periods. So that's during the stressful period and then the not so stressful period. So in terms of positive affect or boosting your mood, walking in nature might produce the most beneficial effects. Next, we're going to cover a study Mark Berman and his colleagues from the Rotman University Institute at Baycrest, which is in Canada. Uh, he also had colleagues that were from Stanford and also the University of Michigan. And these authors examined whether interacting with nature had beneficial effects on memory and also affects so that mood in participants with mild depressive disorder. They examined whether mood would change differently after a walk in nature versus a walk in an urban setting. And what they did is they recruited 20 participants with mild depressive disorder. Participants took an affect test, so that mood test, and then a memory test. And then were randomly assigned to take a 50 to 55 minute walk in the Ann Arbor Arbitorium, which is in Michigan, presumably because it's in downtown Ann Arbor. And these walks were 2.8 miles long. And then one week later, participants returned to the lab and repeated the entire procedure, walking in the location that was not visited in their first session. So it was it was split. Then in this study, participants' memory capacity increased more after the nature walk than after the urban walk. And also, once again, we saw positive affect improve to a greater extent after the nature walk compared to the urban walk. And we have some systematic reviews that really support the positive effects of walking in nature. So a 2022 review published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine titled A Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Nature Walk as an Intervention for Anxiety and Depression. And, and their results found that overall nature walks improved anxiety and depression. And then also a systematic review a year before this by Yasharubi Cotera titled the effects of nature walks on depression and anxiety, a systematic review. 
what they did was they synthesized the effects of nature walks for depression and anxiety. And what they found was nature walks were effective for state anxiety, but not generalized anxiety. And the effects for depression were inconsistent. So state anxiety describes the temporary anxiety experienced when in direct relationship to immediate perceptions of threat versus trade anxiety, which is a relatively stable, durable characteristic that underlies the intensity and tendency for state anxiety responses. So it was interesting because we had that 2022 study that said it was effective for depression and anxiety, but this one saying that perhaps more just for state anxiety, which is interesting, um, but perhaps this could have been because the authors had a slightly different research question. Maybe they were looking at um, different types of research, such as longitudinal versus randomized control trials and, and cross-sectional data. There might have also been new evidence in that one year, or also uh, perhaps any of the authors could have missed some evidence. So one last interesting study titled The Effects of Green and Urban Walking in Different Time Frames on Physiopsychological Responses of Middle-Aged and Older Adults in Chengdu, China. So um, this was an interesting experiment, I thought. Uh, they had a hypothesis which compared walking in a city versus walking in green space at different times during the day. Now, uh, this is interesting because I actually particularly like walking around Boston at night. Um, maybe this is also because we do have quite a bit of green space. But, you know, when I'm walking with Scout, who, like I said, he is asleep for the talk. We do like walking at night. Um, it's, it's quite illuminated in Boston. The, you still receive some kind of sense of awe. Um, it, it, frankly, it's pretty. They have all the lights uh, up right now on the trees. So it's actually nice. It's, you know, it's not as nice as seeing the Grand Canyon or anything like that, not even close. But the night walks in Boston are quite nice. But anyways, the authors in this study hypothesized that urban areas have better, because of urban areas have better illumination, the artificial lights in, scener in cities may improve the scenic experience and sense of safety and add joy to nighttime recreations versus, you know, during the day, traffic and air pollution may re is going to be there and that might not make walking as pleasant. These things also are reduced at night as are noises and the, the crowdedness of the city. So it might make uh, nighttime urban walking more of an enjoyable experience. So what these authors did is they recruited 48 people who were aged 40 to 71 from a community in Chengdu, Sichuan province in China. And the four conditions here were daytime green walking. So walking in a green space, nighttime green walking. So, so same green walking space, but walking at night, daytime urban walking. So walking in the city during the day and nighttime urban walking. So walking in the city at night. And the study participants took two circular routes, which were 1.6 kilometers. And they were set up in a flat and illuminated walkways among the green space and urban areas, respectively. And it took about 20 minutes for them to continue. So systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and pulse rate were measured using a portable electronic sphygmometer, fun word, at the checkpoints before and after the walks. They also assessed their positive and negative affect, uh, mood, specifically tension and anxiety, anger or hostility, fatigue, Depression, vigor, and infusion were also assessed. And also the restorative effects of the environment were, uh, at, they asked the questions about that. So the researchers found that median positive affect scores significantly increased for daytime green walking and also nighttime urban walking. And in this case, negative affect was unchanged. Median scores for vigor significantly increased after daytime green walking and also nighttime urban walking. Urban walking at night was better for restoration than urban walking during the day. And daytime green walking was better than daytime urban walking. And they also found that sy systolic blood pressure significantly decreased after daytime green walking, nighttime green walking, and then also nighttime urban walking. So this didn't happen during daytime urban walking. So these physiological changes demonstrate that the decreases in systolic blood pressure in both nighttime green walking and nighttime urban walking were significantly greater than in daytime urban walking. So both daytime green walking and nighttime urban walking induce significantly positive changes in blood pressure and these psychological outcomes. And nighttime green walking also induced uh, overall lower blood pressure. So it seems like 
walking in nature is good for most times. And also if, if you are going to be walking in the city, maybe the best time if you want positive effects on, on your mood and your blood pressure is actually at night. So how, how much nature do people actually need, which I think is you know, one of the next and interesting and important questions. And this was, there's an interesting 2019 study from the University of Exeter Medical School. So using data from a representative sample, which I think was almost 20,000 people of the adult population in England, the authors aim to better understand the relationship between time spent in nature per week and self-reported health and subjective well-being. In this study, exposure to nature was defined in terms of self-reported minutes spent in natural environments, for recreation in the last seven days and outcomes were self-reported health and subjective well-being. And so what they found was that individuals who spent in between one to 119 minutes in the last week were no more likely to report good health or high well-being than those who actually reported zero minutes, which is, which is interesting. But individuals who reported spending greater than or equal to 120 minutes in nature in the last week had consistently higher levels of both health and well-being than those who reported no exposure. Okay, so what what should we do if it does seem like, you know, taking a walk in nature is going to be more beneficial than just taking a walk in a city? And this might be actually particularly true if you're taking uh, leisure walks around the city during the day. Okay, so what do you do if you don't live near the woods or you don't have transportation to get there? Well, that's fine. So even living in greener urban areas is actually associated with lower probability of cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, asthma, hospitalization, mental distress, and also mortality among adults. So typically cities do have areas of, of green space. I you know, I can speak for Boston where there are two relatively large parks that are, I think are actually called the green, one of them is actually called the Greenway right near me. Uh, we also happen to be right on the Charles River. So it's actually not that uh, challenging to find green spaces um, in this city. So if you do live in a city and you don't have quick access to the woods or to nature, seek out green spaces within your city to do your walks in. So perhaps if you did want to do a walk for some kind of leisure activity, it might be best to find those spaces compared with to just uh, walking in, you know, heavily trafficked areas. Another thing that you can do is you can use an app I like, which is probably quite popular. You might have even heard it. It's the All Trails app. So essentially you can download that app and it will show you all the trails that are in your more immediate vicinity. Um, so also most trail walking is free. So if you have a car, it's also an easy way to get in more exercise at, at a low to no cost. Um, it's not necessarily, this next part's not necessarily exercise. So I know it's a little bit different, but um, I would also imagine taking a lunch break in a green space to be beneficial versus having it in your office. So even if you need to, you know, get your exercise done at the gym, adding in some extra time around, you know, just around green spaces could be benefit beneficial even if you're not exercising during that. Another thing to think about is, so for example, in Boston, in the warmer months, we do have a park series. So it's actually called the Parks Fitness Series. My girlfriend used to go do kickboxing in the park with some of her friends. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, an exercise in the park series is is something that's in other cities. So what I would say is if you do live in, live in, live in an urban area, seek out some green spaces and then perhaps plan to leave the city for nearby trails that provide more nature. I know Scout and I, we actually just did this today and severely enjoy uh, taking visits to a place called Middlesex Fells, which is about 15 minutes away from Boston. It's got uh, hundreds of miles of actual bike trails right there. So we always enjoy going there and he's, he's quite pooped from doing that today. So it's nice to be able to do something that and, and unplug it. Even uh, I actually find it a little bit more beneficial than doing walks, even in green spaces in the city. So if you can only do that maybe once per week, I would imagine that that would also be uh, quite beneficial. And then in my experience, it's it's great to visit the national parks and take at least a full weekend or something like that to really unplug um, and then, you know, make, spend some time in nature and get some physical activity in.